Hi, thank you for having me. Um, so what I'm going to try and do in this presentation is um, raise some questions about the ideas of smallness and smartness in the context of um, census towns, which is what I studied for my PhD project, um, and then try and raise some questions that help me to bridge this thought process in going from my PhD project into this postdoctoral project. So it's going to be a bit of a thinking out aloud mode of presentation, so bear with me and I want to flag some concepts and questions and then we can come back to those when we have the discussion and questions. Um, so I'm going to start by talking about this thing called metrocentricity, which um, I realized is not very popular in, in urban studies vocabulary, but I think it's really key to understanding smallness. Um, so what, what is meant by metrocentricity is this idea that this is the dominant mode or the dominant policy paradigm through which the urban is looked at, investigated, acted upon. Um, and it is not just to say that metropolitan areas or large metropolitan cities are at the center of thinking about um, urbanization processes, but also that everything else is seen in relation to the idea of the metropolitan. So what does that mean for small cities, for example? What it means is that small cities can only emerge on the terrain of urban policy making through their proximity to metropolitan areas. And by proximity, I mean both geographical proximity, so smaller sort of satellite towns and cities around big metropolitan areas are more likely to be high profile and prominent in the urban agenda of the state or even in the academic agenda of urban studies. So that's the geographical proximity aspect, but also in terms of ontological proximity. So small cities have to become more metropolitan in order to be taken seriously. They have to mimic features of the metropolitan in order to be taken seriously or in order to be acted upon, in order to be considered in policy making, in academia, in politics. Um, so that's kind of the overarching framework or assumption that I want to place my research and also sort of this project within this, this paradigm of metrocentricity. So then, because we are looking at, or we are, because we have been given this situation where we are kind of forced to look at small cities in relation to metropolitan areas, one of the questions that I think becomes important is how small is small or how big is small? What do we really mean by small? And then when does this smallness start to matter? Um, and from, from a personal political point of view, smallness should always matter. I mean, every place, every community is important. Uh, but when does it start to matter in the larger scheme of policy making and academic research and, and urban politics? So to answer that question, I'm going to look at this map. Uh, this is a map created by Kanu Charan Pradhan and his associates at uh, Center for Policy Research in New Delhi. And this is a map of all the different census towns as of 2011 in India. And I believe this could not have been an easy task for them because there is no publicly available geotag data on the location of census towns. And I'll come in a bit to talking about what are census towns. But there is no publicly available, accurate, dependable data on the location of census towns. So to be able to create this map, they probably had to go into Google Maps and look for each census town and then transfer that data onto ArcGIS and, or mapping software, whatever they've been using, or depend on word of mouth reports of approximate locations of census towns. And so I believe a huge amount of work has gone into creating this map. Big shout out to Center for Policy Research for doing that. But it's a really important map because it kind of visualizes how big smallness is in India. It's a lot of cities, 2,536 to be precise, in this map. And this phenomenon of census towns, or this category of census towns as a category of knowledge and analysis, um, and policy intervention sort of came into, emerged onto the terrain of urban studies and urban policy making in 2011 or thereabouts because of this explosion in the category. So small towns went big. We suddenly had, we were suddenly faced with 2,500 new census towns. So when the data from the 2011 census became publicly available, this was one of the things that demographers and geographers and urban planners noticed and it was 
it was after a long period of time that small towns were back on the agenda of thinking about the urban. So what exactly are census towns? Census towns, as defined by the census, are um, the smallest size category of urban centers in India. And the criteria for being um, categorized as a census town for a settlement is to fulfill 5,000 population, 75% of the male working population should be employed outside of agriculture. Um, and there has to be a density of 400 per square kilometers, but that's kind of negotiable for hill areas and desert areas and forest areas and things like that. So by the state's own epistemic logic or epistemic structure, a settlement is considered or can be considered urban as soon as it, it reaches 5,000 population. But if you look at the policy documents that are in place and the different schemes and programs that are in existence right now, the smallest category of urban centers that you can probably see those policy uh, implementations trickling down to is perhaps 100,000. Anything beyond 100,000, even a 50,000 strong town, is almost non-existent. It's almost not written about. And as Natasha mentioned, for most of these uh, high-profile schemes like the JNNURM and Amroth, small cities come sort of as an afterthought, as an annex, you know, as an appendix attached to the back of the document. Sort of like, we are going to do this with the metropolitan areas, and oh, by the way, we're also going to put some buses over there and some, um, yeah. Uh, so much so that once this data became publicly available and there was a national conversation around it. Sometime in 2012 or thereabouts, the Minister of uh, Power, uh, Piyush Goel at that time, uh, made an announcement saying, well, we are going to extend electricity, we are going to uh, electrify all census towns. And it's a bit counterintuitive, isn't it? You would think of an urban area as already electrified. I mean, it's one of the basic urban services or basic services that settlements should be provided with. And this declaration of being able to, and recently there was a declaration again that now India is 100% electrified, all villages are electrified. But this declaration came after this explosion in the category of census towns took place. So one of, my, one of the things that I spent about a year and a half doing as part of my PhD was to figure out how do census towns come about? Who gets to decide at what point a place becomes a census town? And what happens after that? And what I found out was that the data that is collected as part of a census, the smallest unit where a census is carried out in India is a census village. And this does not necessarily correspond with administrative villages or panchayats or revenue villages. The, talking about institutional uh, heterogeneity, there is a lot of it in India. And, um, so a census village is not necessarily something that is otherwise present in the public imagination or even in the state imagination, but it suddenly becomes prominent uh, during the time of the census, which happens once every 10 years. So at the time of a census, when the data is collected for every census village, um, and when all the data is gathered, there would be statisticians sitting and looking at the data, and when they find that the census village has exceeded uh, all these um, assigned criteria for being, allocated, for, for being categorized as a census town, they put CT next to its name on an Excel sheet. And that's how a census town comes into being. Most of these statisticians do not, have not been to any of the census towns that are now becoming census towns. Um, but anyhow, so that Excel sheet becomes publicly available, it becomes data, and there is euphoria or dysphoria about the nature of urbanization and the scale of urbanization in India. So this happens when the census is concluded, let's say for the 2011 census, this probably got concluded around 2009, and then nothing happens. Then this data sort of is there in the census office, and nobody looks at it. And then come the next census cycle, which is about now, in 2018 or 19 for the 2021 cycle, people go back to looking at this data and then they realize, okay, so there are these many new census towns and we now have to uh, see what's happened to them thereafter. And so this process goes on and on. So what happens when a place gets categorized as a census town? Usually nothing happens because this categorization as a census town does not necessarily correlate to an administrative transfer from a rural governance structure to an urban governance structure. That process is something that has to be legislated upon by each state government. And each state government would have its own criteria for deciding at what point it wants to legislate upon 
this kind of an urban governance, um, creating a municipality or creating a municipal corporation. In West Bengal, the criteria is 30,000 population. So what happens to a settlement when it's going from 50,000 to 30,000? We don't know, because there is sort of a policy vacuum and a data vacuum. And also, from what I was told by numerous district officials and other um, urban planners, um, this is a process that is very much mediated by political concerns. So a place gets allocated a municipal body, an urban governance structure, only when it suits the agenda of the party that is in power. So I wanted to think about smallness in a web of big, and I'm taking inspiration here from Jason Moore's book, Capital in the Web of Life, uh, to look at the interconnectedness. So the picture on the left is, uh, it shows all the different census towns where I carried out pilot visits, and the black one in the middle is, um, or in the side is Kolkata. And each of these places had stories to tell about its relationship to Kolkata. In one of the places, uh, the one that is mapped on the right, uh, one of my interviewees said, if this town collapses, then all of Kolkata would have no potatoes to eat. In another place, um, somebody said, if, uh, if our economy collapses, then there would be a severe uh, mustard oil crisis in Kolkata. And anybody who knows a Bengali diet knows how apocalyptic that is. So, so these places are, of course, existing in this web of relations with larger urban centers, but they're also existing quite literally in a web of relations with their surrounding rural. And this here is a map that I created through participatory mapping exercises in Gorbita town, um, and then digitized on ArcGIS. And what it essentially shows is that Gorbita town, as it exists in the public imagination of the people who live there, um, covers what is allocated or categorized as Gorbita census town and Amlagora census town, two separate census towns on that Excel sheet that is in the public domain. So the point I'm trying to make is that the Indian state really doesn't know much about the nature of smallness that exists in the urban spectrum. And from the looks of it, it is not really interested in understanding the nature of smallness in the urban spectrum. And that's something that we need to take up. And I'll move on now quickly to the smartness aspect of it. So smartness, um, as we discussed before, is obviously connected to digital technologies. But one of the questions that I think we should really consider is what physical infra infrastructures are needed for smartness, but also what social infrastructures. I think I should have written that in there also. And how does the small do smartness? So to discuss that, I'm going to talk about um, two examples, also from, my, also from Gorbita town. Um, so I want to go back here to the concept of Jugar, which I think is quite popular. It's been popularized by Har uh, Barbara Harris-White and many others. And it's usually thought of in connection to the informal economy in metropolitan areas seen as seen in designated subaltern spaces like slums, etc. But Jugar essentially is a creative deployment of resourcefulness in the absence of public service provisioning and in the absence of infrastructure. So it's sort of working around that working around these absences to make life go on. So what we see here is a picture of something called Rose Education Center, which operates out of one of the floors in this building. And if you could zoom in a little bit, um, you can see it names here universities from Haryana, Andhra Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, and it's recognized by the Central uh, uh, Grants Commission, by the NCERT, which is a high school level board. So it's, it has all these different institutional affiliations. And the, from, from a first look, it would look like a scam. How does this one floor thing in this one little town have all these affiliations. So what they do is essentially they provide the administrative and executive ser services related to higher education. So at the time of admissions, they would procure forms from all these different universities and distribute those. And people in the surrounding villages could come there and fill up their administration forms. And then they transfer those forms. At the time of examinations, they conduct examinations. They kind of provide the physical space for students to come and write examinations. And these are obviously services that are not being provided by the state. So it's one of the examples of digital technologies being put to Jugaru use in a small city. Um, similarly, we have here something called fast track computers, which is essentially a showroom for laptops and computers, which are not really very much in demand in a place like uh, Gorbita because people just don't have the purchasing power to have personal computers. But what they also do is to 
procure discarded laptops, usually through personal networks in metropolitan areas, and then repair them and reuse them and loan them out to uh, clubs, which are also an important part of the social socialization structure in the place. So the clubs are basically um, a, a group of youth coming together to pursue an activity of their choice. So they loan them out to the clubs for movie nights, for uh, streaming news, when they're for streaming cricket matches. So they cultivate, they foster this sort of socialization facilitated by digital technologies. Um, and they also actually enable people to invest in stocks and shares because they have two people who are sitting on laptops always. Uh, almost every household has a trader, a potato trader in Gorbita, and that is kind of their side job. And they would invest the profits they make from this trade into stocks and shares. And they would have a couple of people sitting at fast track computers all day long making decisions on behalf of these traders. So I just want to end with. Um, these examples of Jugaru applications of digital technologies of smartness in small cities. And um, yeah, I'm just going to conclude by saying that there is a lot on the Indian urban spectrum that we don't know about, and a lot that can really nuance and, as Sanjay said, fraught our ideas and our ways of doing research about smartness and smallness um, in the Indian urban spectrum. So I'll end with that.